Welcome to Wagon Wheel on this Friday as, well, we only really do them on Fridays anymore. So it's always a Friday on Wagon Wheel. Uh, I've got a lot to talk about. Um, uh, if you've got any questions out there, um, raise your hand for requests. We're recording this live on Spotify Green Room. We'll be putting it up in all the different places I put things up uh, after that. But yeah, if you do have a request, uh, line them up and we'll talk to them a little bit. I went to my first 100 game the other day. Well, the first 100 game, in fact. The first ever. The first, uh, well, it was the first and only for about 24 hours, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was incredible. Uh, there was a lot of things that I thought were very interesting about it. One was that it just had a completely different vibe to any cricket ground I've ever been to before. Very family orientated. Even... Uh, so I know someone commented on Twitter, oh, you obviously haven't been to a lot of women's cricket. I mean, I've been going to women's cricket for over, well, for a very long time, uh, more than a decade. I've never felt uh, that much of a family vibe um, in a game. Uh, there have been um, some occasions where a lot of families have turned up, but it felt like it was aimed at families rather than aimed at anyone else, which was quite interesting. The other thing was just the level of cricket. It's just quite clear now that women's cricket is just going ballistic in in its growth and how much better it is um this game this domestic game that i watched was so much better than the international women's cricket i was watching five years ago in the, in the world cup uh in india it's just exploded and it's incredible to watch the talent of the of the women's game and the way that it's grown so um huge huge change there and it was uh, it was great took my family uh, they very much liked it. Uh, my son came home and wanted to know about um, Sophia Eggington, uh, close enough, uh, and Heather Knight. She didn't even play in the game, but that's because he's been c collecting the tops cards <laughs> and is a very big fan of the cricket cards. So, uh, yeah, I think as far as that went, it, it was fine. Some of the gimmicks, the hundredy gimmicks, if you will, still don't make a lot of sense, uh, and they may not for a long time. But uh, certainly, I think... Uh, it did a lot of the things that they wanted it to do. I think it was aimed at a newer audience. There was certainly a very new audience there. Um, I think, I don't know how many, what the final crowd was, seven or 8,000 people. That seems like a lot of people for a women's domestic cricket game to me. Um, if not the most ever, then certainly one of the most ever. So uh, phenomenal um, situation to be in. I absolutely love going to the game. I've actually got quite a few... Uh, questions on Patreon just to start us off. So if you have a question and you're in the Spotify, Spotify, Spotify Green Room now, uh, obviously just uh, request. Uh, there's a discussion thing if you want to just write a question. But, you know, we did this so that you could ask questions live. So put your hand up and make a request. Um, but I've got some really interesting ones on Patreon. Um, uh, one was from Ian Price where he was just talking about uh, what happens if there is a, uh, you know, some – more outbreaks of COVID when it comes to the county season. It, it, look, it's really interesting. I saw something with the NFL, where the NFL were basically saying that you could forfeit a game if your players weren't vaccinated or your coaching staff weren't vaccinating and you and you had an outbreak. Um, you know, sporting leagues are starting to get, what, a little bit, is harder the right word, uh, but they're starting to look at things a little bit differently um, than they were before when, uh, you know, now they're starting to say that the players and the teams have a, a huge part to play here we, we saw with the Sri Lankan players how some and, and we know that just from our general life you know maybe from your neighbors or people who live in your area not everyone takes it as seriously as other people do uh, a lot of people listen to Facebook uh, never listen to Facebook uh, <laughs> so look it's uh, it is very possible that the Royal London Cup doesn't play uh, it's very uh, possible that major major parts of the county season are uh, ripped in, in, in into shreds I think that's where uh, I think, you know, we saw with Australia West Indies um, the other day. Obviously, there have been other COVID tournaments that have um, uh, come, not COVID tournaments, but, but COVID things come and go. Uh, yeah, could really, really affect uh, T20 cricket, uh, domestic cricket, uh, international cricket. The World Cup's a really interesting one. They quite clearly should not be um, operating the Olympics at the moment. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. Uh, Michael Hannes. Uh, uh, asks, have you ever thought about rebranding all your podcasts under one title, the Jared Kimber experience? I think if you have a look, Michael, I go out of my way not to use my name um, as much as possible. It's a fine name. I'm not. I'm not against my name, um, but I like, to, I like to give it a bit of th something. I think Red Ink. Uh, we're up to two podcasts a week now, so these live ones that we're doing, um, and we're also uh, quite clearly going to be doing um, just the normal Red Inkers as well. So up to two a uh, week with Red Inker. We've got plans to move that um, uh, to three podcasts, maybe not for the next couple of months, but eventually 
move that up a little bit. Uh, double Sentry, I like keeping Double Sentry on its own, especially because, you know, Abhishek Mukherjee helps me, Max Wiggins helped me, Bertie Moores used to help me. Uh, there's, you know, it's more of a collaborative thing. And going forward, it, it will be so different to every, all the other podcasts because obviously it's a narrative and everything. So I think Red Inc. will probably expand. And, uh, you know, if I ever get any funding for Double Sentry, and I've been fairly close to it already, uh, we'd be looking at probably doing it as a weekly podcast but of seasons so you know you'd have five, five weeks of one season and um seven weeks of another season but just every week there would be a new episode on on uh, cricket history that's one of the great things remember someone said to me you know oh it's kind of tough if you're going to do a cricket history podcast because you know there's only so much i'm like you, i mean cricket is just such a vast uh old international sport um that it just there's this so much you know we haven't really cracked into the 1700s uh yet um you don't hear that a lot on podcasts do you but one day we will um so thanks for your question um chris whitehead has asked is there any takeaway from the fact that all coaches in the hundred are um overseas it's a really really interesting one and i know that this upset a lot of english coaches but there aren't a lot of english coaches as head coaches in T20 leagues around the world because there's so many county jobs. And so they end up in county cricket and county cricket is one part of your job. I know we have had specialist um, county cricket coaches. I'm trying to, th- uh, blast coaches, sorry. I think Dan Vittori did it. And, uh, oh, I'm missing the other one. Oh, John Wright did it at Derby as well. So it has happened before, uh, although they're both overseas, which sort of tells you the same thing. There's also the big complication of, did anyone want to give up their county job to go to 100 and then is that the right way of doing it? Is it not better up to train them, uh, better to train these coaches as assistants um, in the system and then have them take over? But yeah, I don't think it says anything about the coaching depth of English cricket. I think it says more to do with just the situation that they found themselves in. And you probably find more English coaches coaching associate teams um, at times, you know, guys like Andy Moles. And um, I've forgotten the coach of Hong Kong w- w- was English as well. Whereas... It just doesn't seem to happen as much in the T20 leagues. I think Paul Nixon is one of the few, but again, he's with a county now. Um, so I think it's probably more to do with someone like that. I think James Foster um, is certainly a name that if you're, if, you know, if you're the sort of person who wants to look at uh, county cricket names, uh, sorry, uh, English coaching names, James Foster is one I would keep an eye on. He's, he's been the assistant everywhere. He's had a little bit of head coaching experience as well, I, I believe already. And he's setting himself up to be a T20 coach. So be very interesting to see if he ends up with a T20 franchise. Um, uh, well, sorry, not a T20 franchise, with a 100 franchise uh, coming up into the future. Um, Archie Lee Ellis asked, do you think Matt Parkinson should be given a run in the test squad? Look, I, I just think that for as slow as he is, and I think it's quite obvious how slow Matt Parkinson is through the air, and that that is a concern. There is a reason he's taken a lot of wickets. And I think I'd rather see a bowler like him found out at the international level rather than people just going, he's too slow. I, I don't like that. I don't like when you say that because it doesn't really make sense for their record. Um, and so with Matt Parkinson, I'd like to see him play as much cricket as possible to see how good he is. Uh, I don't, I can't see him taking wickets at the test level consistently international, but I'm a big fan. I, I really like what he does. A really interesting uh, young cricketer. Peter Delapena, the PDP, um, asks, oh God, it's a Peter Delapena question. So it's about 100. Um, it's very, very long. Let me have a look. Um Considering the policies in place for, for the American sports, uh, if when a player a test positive with COVID, do international cricket's COVID policies need to be reevaluated and revised in the context of the second ODI between Australia and the West Indies? So for those of you who don't know, second ODI was cancelled um, uh, due to someone testing positive. Look, I think that I would assume that at the moment, we probably have a bunch of different protocols, PDP. Uh, I'm, I haven't been following it directly, but I would say T20 leagues and county cricket probably has different protocols to international cricket. Uh, there's different costs involved. There's different bubbles. There's different countries. Um, but yeah, I don't think specifically that cricket has completely nailed uh, the the setup of, of of COVID and everything. But I suppose there's another, you know, the, the NFL has just changed their policy as well. So I think a lot of these leagues are kind of learning on the on the fly a little bit, aren't they? And then the last one from Will Cooling, which is in no way an easy question. He says, if you had $60 million uh, that the ECB once had in reserves, how would you have spent it to grow the game in the UK? I don't think 
growing the game, uh, the game of cricket in the UK requires $60 million. I think it requires political intervention and trying to work out why one of the most British English sports ever that has changed the way that people speak, uh, that is a big part of English society, that is a big part of the Commonwealth and the history of England and other countries that England have been involved with isn't being taught at state schools as a sport, let alone as a history subject, which would be cool. Imagine that. Imagine if I retired from cricket writing and just taught um, cricket history in schools. Um, that would be weird, but I am available. But I think that's where it has to be. I said this from the start. If you're not playing cricket in state schools, and uh, my son, I think this year, uh, I think both of my sons, I don't think either of them played cricket at school this year. They both go to two different state schools. Um, seems like a really obvious one to me. That is... The last time I checked, the kids are at the schools. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, all of those questions on Patreon. I think I've got a few people coming up here on the speaker requests. Let's see who we got first. Basil, you are muted. But whenever you're ready to go, I can see you. Have I caught Basil off guard? Here he is. Basil, how are you doing? Yeah, hi. Hi, Jared. How are you doing? I'm very good. What's your question, my man? Yeah, uh, I have two questions. Is that okay? Yeah, as, we'll see. I'm going to grade you. Okay. Okay, the first question is, uh, I think one of your videos or podcasts, you said uh, batting is a strong uh, skill and the bowling is a weakling skill. Mm -hmm. That's in T20 cricket. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that got me thinking, how do you like um, evaluate the impact of an innings in a, in a match? Like, I'm currently talking about uh, ODI here, but uh, is that okay? Like, uh, for okay. example, in the uh, yeah. Ireland versus South Africa match, Andrew Melbourne scored uh, 102. That was Ireland facing South Africa in their own home, and they ended up winning the match. But the, in that um, England versus Pakistan match, Barbara Sam scored uh, 158, getting his team to 332, but ended up losing the match. So how do you calculate the impact of uh, Innings, innings, innings is like that. Yeah, I mean, some yeah, I, I, some of those things you said we can't really uh, work them out, uh, but we we would know. I'm trying to think of where, where the um, Baba Azam game. Which ground was that? Was that uh, Nottingham? I'm trying to remember. Uh, was that a high a high scoring ground? I so you do have to factor in. Yeah, you do have to factor in the pitch. Right, so you have to factor in if it's a high, high scoring ground or a low scoring ground. So Andrew Balbunis was at Malahide. Off the top of my head, I would assume that Malahide's a high scoring ga game, a ground for white ball cricket, only because almost every time I seem to watch Ireland, someone seems to smash the ball out of the park. Maybe it is because it is a literal park. You smash the ball out of there. Great, great place though. Malahide is. It does feel like that. You know, I remember watching the Dutch and the Scottish players absolutely pepper the boundaries um, in a tournament there a couple of years ago, um, and the same with the. Um, Ireland, South African games I've been watching recently. Uh, so you have to, you, you do have to um, uh, look at that. You also look at what situation the two batters came into. So Andrew Balboni was opening, uh, Baba was coming down, how early he came in. Uh, so there, there's a lot of different parts of that. So if you look at a, a, a number three entering um, against England on that particular surface, what would their, what would the average score that you would expect a player to make in that situation against England be? Um, and then how far over did he go that, how much quicker or slower in, in that particular situation? I think it's probably the best sort of basic way that we can do it. But there's a lot of, there's absolutely no doubt that, you know, there are way, there are certain things that are hard to weigh up. Like Babaraza might have attacked a certain bowler, which meant that England had to shift their plans. But don't, doesn't necessarily, I'm not sure there's a, a statistic that we have come up with yet or an advanced metric really that we've come up with yet that would uh, have a look at that. But on the very base thing, I would think that scoring 150 would be of, of more um, importance than scoring 100 runs, just on uh, unless you've done it very slowly um, in, in a general rule. And my, my memory of Andy's innings was that slightly better than a runner ball, I think, uh, maybe uh, around 95 uh, um, uh, deliveries. And I saw a bit of Baza, Baba Azams, but I can't remember how many deliveries. But you have to factor that in as well. Baba's um, was about one, 138, 139 something goals. He scored about 100. Uh, for, his, for his 100, was it? Uh, yeah. Oh, Second okay. So 100, 100. 
Oh, okay. So roughly around the same strike rate for both of them then. So yeah, so then you have to look in opposition. Uh, eventually, what we, if, if we were going all the way in, we'd want to know boundary size as well, because that obviously plays a big part of it. Um, the, 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 you know, the experience of the opposition bowlers, um, is probably something that, you know, maybe going forward might be interesting, especially as teams rest players and play second 11s in this particular case. Like, you know, um, and Barbara's arms going up against a second string bowling attack compared to a first string bowling attack and all those sorts of things. You might even want to factor in their domestic records. Um, but yeah, on a very, on a very normal, uh, sort of way, what, what I would be doing is I would be looking at what you would expect a number three to make in that situation when he came to the wicket. And, and the same with Andy Balboni, what you would expect an opener in Malahide to do against the bowling attack, the quality of South Africa's. Uh, you had one more question, did you? I'll answer the second one quickly. It's a big one, and I don't expect you to answer right away. But uh, I like I would like like to know your thoughts on it. You know, mm-hmm. the 2023 like for ICC is going to be the big year. It's going to be the the next WTC cycle ends there. The next ODI World World Cup is coming, and after that they have planned to implement all these changes, like 14 teams for the ODI World Cup, 20 teams for the T20 World Cup. So yeah. uh, hypothetically, if you are given the like the reign. And also the FTP, current F- FTP uh, ends on 2023. So if you're given the reign to decide that uh, how to run cricket between 2023 and 2031, how do you go about it? Like, I, I have seen you I talk would. about uh, your, your yeah. plans for WTC, uh, you know, T20 World no, qualification, be. etc. That would be very, very, very easy. I'd have qualification tournaments for the World T20 and the Olympics. Um, I, will not, I know it's not called a World T20 anymore, but the the T20 uh, World Cup, uh, I'd have qualification tournament for that and a qualification tournament for the Olympics. And I wouldn't play any other international um, T20 cricket outside of friendlies when teams are trying to prepare for tournaments, uh, which I think is absolutely fine and, and, and completely normal. And then I'd sell the ODI League and the T20 League men and women uh, as a package. Uh, and I use that the money from the streaming uh, rights and the TV rights to pay the players and everything. And then I'd create proper leagues with uh, promotion and relegation, uh, probably three tier leagues uh, for one day cricket and test cricket. So you'd have maybe, let's say seven teams in division one, seven teams in division two, seven teams in division three, same in one day cricket or I'm also okay with two, two divisions of, of, um, of nine teams in each, uh, but a proper promotion and relegation, a proper home and away kind of structure as much as we can do it. Uh, test cricket makes that a little bit harder, but that that is what I would do. Um, so thank you very much for your questions, Basil. Uh, who do we have next here? Uh, we've got Dhruv. Dhruv, uh, how you doing? Oh, Dhruv, you there? You've taken off mute. Roof. All right, Drew, I'm going to put you back on mute. Oh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to, if I ever work that out. But Drew, uh, I'll talk to Knuckle for next. And if Drew, if you're still there and you haven't fallen asleep, um, you can come back and chat in a bit. Uh, Knuckle from, uh, from uh, Gorilla Cricket, how are you doing? Not too bad, Jared. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, um, just we did the first men's hundred game last night, and I'm still recovering from it. Commentating that ball by ball is even more manic than uh, it's like doing an entire game of Ravindra Jadeja overs. Yeah, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, but it sounds like I, I read your your piece the other day. It sounds like you you all had a good time. But my question is, you were talking about the particularly there's a lot of Australian coaches at the top level of men's T20 cricket, whether that in in leagues all over the world. Given that coaching depth and given how you know, you need to do an awful lot of work to make yourself a good a good coach or a good analyst. Why is the men's T20 team seemingly so far behind the curve? Um, I don't think the two are as related as we would probably want them to be. Like, uh, there is a reason that I, I, my personal belief is there's a reason why there are so many men, Australian men's coaches around the world and Australian women's coaches now around the uh, world, although they're quite often men as well. And that is because Australia started developing coaches in the 80s um, at a time where the rest of the world wasn't, didn't even really believe cricket coaching was a thing. Uh, you know, coaching is a huge uh, part of uh, Australian sport and has a, has a long legacy. And I think 
you know, cricket was part of that. We had the first academies realistically, um, you know, with Road Marsh and all those sorts of things. And I think what then happened was when Australia cricket got really good, you then have, you know, someone like Brad Hodge or Darren Lehman and these sorts of players coming through uh, who are ready to coach. Um, and also, as, a, as I said before, there's not as many jobs in Australian cricket. So you have all these people with reputation so someone like you know jason gillespie who's obviously coached around the world and uh brad hodge who's coached around the world and these sorts of people so they've got a reputation we, we all remember them being part of incredible australian teams and then you have the skills that they have but unlike england where the exact same people are sometimes available they're they're off uh with the county setup and i and i think what has happened is that we have overestimated how good australian coaches are based on the fact that for a long time they were almost all we had and I think that was a big part of it. As far as the Australian T20 team comes together, it, it, they've, they've, never, they've never thought about what they're doing as a team. Uh, the, interestingly enough, they got Justin Langer in, who was a special, oh, wow, be unfair to call him a specialist T20 coach, but almost all of his success with, with Perth or with Western Australia was white ball. He wasn't a particularly good red ball coach. Um, he comes across... And you would think that they would have a really strong thought process about it because I don't know if you remember, Perth Scorchers were very disciplined. They they chose very interesting overseas players. They had a different style about the way that they played T20 cricket to everyone else. And I thought, I, I didn't think Justin Lang was a good idea. I didn't think he was the right person to take over from Darren Lehman after what happened with Sandpaper Gate. But I thought the one thing that would be better for Australian cricket is you would have someone who thoroughly understands T20 cricket. It just hasn't transpired. And I think part of the reason is that I still would say, if, if, you, if you held a gun to my head right now and asked me who the, which T20 bowler in the world I would pick first, I would probably pick Rashid Khan. And then just behind that, I would pick Mitchell Stark. And I think Jasper Brummer and many other bowlers are incredible. But Mitchell Stark doesn't play T20 cricket. He barely turns up. Like, and, and, and when he does, it's for one or two games here and there. And we saw what he was like in, that, in the IPL season he played. And we've seen what he's been like at the two World Cups, and uh, I'm talking one-day World Cups, where he won the player of the tournament in 2015. And he was better in 2019. We know what a great white ball bowler Mitchell Stark is, but he doesn't play. Josh Hazelwood, they haven't really... Josh Hazelwood hasn't played um, enough IPL cricket. He doesn't play big bash cricket. And he doesn't play enough for Australia. Again, could be a very, very good player. And I think there's a lot of guys out there. And then what you have is you have a, a bunch of players who are playing out of position because all the best players are openers and they haven't been able to do, develop their really, really good players, five, six, seven, and eight. And on top of that, they don't have an all-rounder, which to be fair, you can have all the coaches and all the Mitchell Starks you want in the world if you don't have someone who is a legitimate all-round talent or in Moe and Ellie and Ben Stokes's case, guys who can mix, mix and match as all-rounders, I think that causes a bit of a problem. But but yeah, it, look, it's a really interesting question. I, I I just feel that they've never just sat down and really gone, do you know what? We've got two years before the World T20. That's what we're going to focus on now. And I've never, I've never felt, I keep calling it World T20, T20 World Cup. I've never felt like they've done that. Um, and, and, you know, it'd be fascinating to get Dan Brady on to, to talk about something like that because he follows them a lot closer than I do. But I just don't remember that ever being a conversation. They, they usually say, we want to be number one in all three formats. And they've been saying that for about 20 years, well, maybe not 20 years, 15 years. And it's a great thing to say, but now you have to, that, that, that is what everyone wants to say. I, I want to be, I want to be a millionaire, you know, I, fine. How are you going to get to that stage? And I haven't seen the Australian team build on that. It, it, it just feels like, you, you know, you throw a bunch of sort of accumulator openers and then Glenn Maxwell do something, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, it, it, and if it's not Glenn Maxwell, it's like, okay, we've got Marcus Thornis and he smashes the ball. So we'll bat him at six. And it's like, well, it doesn't fit at six. Like, you know, and Steve Smith is like a prototype T20 number four, and uh, and they bat him at number three because he wants to bat at number three, and he's Steve Smith, and and I get it. But Joe Root's not even in the English team, right? There has to be real thinking about how you put these teams together, and uh, at the moment they haven't done that. I will say that uh, without uh, you know uh, giving anyway any confidences, I have been talking to the some people with and around the Australian cricket team more of recent times, they are actually starting to think more about T20 cricket. I think before they played it, and now they're starting to think about it. So things have changed. But great question, mate. Thank you very much. Who have we got next here? Oh, Drew, are you there? Or... Oh, there you are, sir. <laughs> How you doing? What's your question? Yeah, I get it. So my question is on the West Indies test team. I believe they will 
on path to make some progress. But do you think they've taken a step back by getting Craig Brathwaite as captain, by getting him in as captain? Because he's been in he's been struggling last two years with his own batting form. And when Jason Holder wanted to be captain, they've just gone with him. Do you think they've taken yeah. a step back or I remember um, the Caribbean Cricket Podcast uh, guys talking about this and they were saying that they were surprised that everyone else didn't realise that Jason Holder had to be removed as captain because they'd lost so many series. And at, at a certain point, they just thought, you know, we need something new. And I get that, but I was thinking, what captain would have made West Indies win more than Jason Holder? And I think that that has to be something that you process when you are making that decision. I'm not saying that Craig Brathwaite is a step back. I I think he's an interesting thinker about cricket. I've been watching him since, I was about to say I've been watching him since he was a kid, but then I realized that sounded creepy. But I've been following his career for quite a long time uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, um, him as a cricketer. And I think he's a phenomenally talented player. And... I'm just not sure there is a captain that is going to make them win successfully. When you look at the West Indies team, it's kind of like, maybe what's the best way of putting it? It's almost like a sort of a very Australian-like team, but maybe without Steve Smith, and that's a huge without uh, player in that I don't think they will ever be out of test matches or out of test match series just because their bowlers are going to catch fire and it's such a ridiculously talented bowling lineup. And they're going to take a lot of wickets. And with Roston Chase and Rakeem Cornwall, they then have sort of all roundery options in, you know, sort of two different players for when they travel to Asia as well. Uh, Jason Holder with the ability to bat at number six or number seven, perhaps, uh, gives them even more depth and flexibility within that, that team. But they don't have a top order. And so that means there's going to be a lot of collapses and a lot of times where they just don't make any runs. And I, I think we all, you know, if you look at um, domestic cricket numbers uh, within uh, West Indies cricket, they, there doesn't seem to be that. They don't seem to be producing first-class batters who average over 40. So if that's the case, I just don't know how the captain comes into that. Like, what is he supposed to do? If only our team could score 250 runs regularly, our bowlers would have something to bowl at. Um, and the times when we do score that many runs, uh, we, will, we will have that ability. So, it, look, it's a really good question. I think it's something I've talked about a lot. We, we essentially, we put so much pressure on the captain. I, I can't remember, someone was saying this the other day, like it might've been Abhishek Mukherjee or Kartikeya when he was fighting with uh, people about Saurav Ganguly's captaincy. And it's like, okay, so if we had switched his streak with Steve Waugh in the, in the late 90s, would we now be saying that his streak is one of the greatest captains of all time? And, you know, that is a perfectly respectable way of looking at it. When it comes down to it, there is a lot that a captain can do. But when I say a lot, they maybe affect somewhere between 0 and 3% of the game because most bowling changes are made because someone's tired or they need a rest. Um, and the batting order is pretty much, especially in test cricket, set up. And even field placing, I don't think, you know, unless you're Shane Warne and you're moving the field every t- 22 seconds, I don't think that that really has as much an effect as other people think. Um, in fact, one thing I've noticed over the last couple of years is keeping a really bog ordinary field uh, to seamers with two slips and extra fielders on the leg side. So what we would have thought in the 90s to be a really defensive field has ended up being quite an attacking field in modern cricket because players will keep playing the shots, they'll keep trying to find the gaps. Um, and it brings in, uh, it allows you to bolt the stumps more and get more LBWs and all those sorts of things. So it's a really, really fascinating question. Uh, and, and thank you very much for that. Hopefully I answered it. I answered something, didn't I? All right, who we got next here? Oh, is it are you? Sorry, you disappeared. Yep. Hi, hi, Jared. How are you? Yeah, very good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so my question is, uh, Jared, uh, I was just now watching uh, the India Sri Lanka uh, match that is going on, and that made me yeah. wonder that you know, although India has all sorts of depth in ODI and T20I, uh, but they seem to be in Test they don't have too many batsmen. Like you know, it's it's K- KL Rahul whom they are trying to retrofit in the middle order and, you know, probably Hanuma Vihari, who, who is the next big guy. But in test cricket, typically, there is not many uh, batsmen who can bat. And that also comes from the observation that now I'm watching all these uh, star boys of IPL cricket, you know, who are who seem to, you know, get starts, get, get blistering 40s, but are not able to even uh, 
circumvent themselves to get a longer 150 200 or you know they they, they don't you know i know it's early but it seems mm. like they're too excitable they come back of huge records uh, in their in their uh, you know in their states but in states they have their star players and here they have to mingle along with all the other batsmen who are equally yeah i understand uh, what you're saying i i, mean, I, cer- I certainly do understand what you're saying but I don't know. If you went to Australia right now and you offered them KL Raul, Vahari, Shreyas Iyer, Prithvi Shaw, um, who, who else is outside the test the test team who's a phenomenal talent? Like, I think Australia will be like, we'll have them all, right? We'll have them all. We might not be able to fit them all in right now. We'll have them all. So realistically, I would say that you could make a very, very good claim that even a second Indian batting lineup would probably be maybe in the top four or five batting lineups in the world. So what you're talking about is, you know, uh, is all right, but it's fairly normal thing for younger batters as well. Like, you know, th- there are occasionally younger batters like someone like Will Pekoski or, or Pajara who come along, or Brathwaite, in fact, um, who we were talking about earlier, who come along fully formed as test players. But most players come along like Michael Clark, like excitable puppy dogs, trying to hit everything for four. I mean, we've already talked about Steve Waugh. Steve Waugh... Um, I had to remodel his game for test cricket because it's such a different format um, to even first class cricket. And uh, I think it might have been uh, Ian Price, one of the people who um, support me on Patreon. He brought up something brilliant recently where he said to me, if you look at first class cricket, essentially up until the point that you play first class cricket, you don't play a lot of multi-day cricket. If you're a 12-year-old, you know, you're playing more limited overs, limited time. Uh, You might play two-day cricket, if you're lucky. You might play the odd three-day game or the odd four-day game. But it isn't really until you get into the first-class system that you start playing regular four-day cricket. Then, if you're 22 and you're really good, you then get promoted to five-day cricket, which, again, is different. It has... uh, different challenges the pitches are slightly different um there's generally a uh, more spin towards the end of the game because the pitches do deteriorate in a different way uh so realistically it i think this has always been the case that players have learned to play test cricket by playing in it and when you you know you you my list off the top of my head there that's a pretty good list isn't it i I, you know, outside of New Zealand, I reckon a lot of teams would be like, if you offer that as our top five, uh, we'll probably have it over our current top five, or at the very least, we'll have a bunch of them. Right, Jared. So my so my question was regarding, uh, you know, if in you know in ODIs they they take players like Ishwaran or KS Bharat, who are nowhere close to getting into the uh, getting into a spot in uh, test. So when they have these, uh, you know, stalwarts and Rohit, uh, Virat, and you know, uh, and Ajinkya and J- Pujara, why don't they start shuffling around the batting order? Or, you know, is is because they have not... Sorry, shuffling, and, shuffling which batting order? Uh, as in, you know, playing Bihari in place of Pujara or playing, uh, you know, or making... Pl- because Pujara is one of the best players in the world. Like, right, why, but why, uh, he will not why, be here all, always, right? Uh, so they, yes, they need the next. You should be picking your, your best lineup. If you think that Bihari is going to be able to do the job that Pujara does, and I... The, as, I think Vahari's a great player, but I think we're a long way away from no, knowing that. Why would you dump another fantastic player for another player t- to groom them in what is a really tough position at number three in an era when it's when we've never... This is arguably the best bowling era um, in, in a very long time. I just... I don't really understand why you would do that. You keep picking your best players and, and eventually you might think, okay, well, Vahari in the next couple of years might average 37. Um, and maybe Pajara would average 40. And you think, okay, well, in that case, we can groom him, get him in this position to be able to do that. But that's what the A team's for, really. And that's what injuries allow you to do. It's actually, I, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but I think uh, Kartikeya did something once where the most tests that any lineup has ever played together is 12. So we have constant fluctuations all the times in cricket teams. So there will be opportunities for Vihari and, um, uh, I'm trying to, who else did I say? Kale Raul and, um, Prithvi Shaw and all the other guys. Yeah, there, there will be opportunities for them. I don't think you need to force opportunities on them. Um, you know, if, if you feel that Rahane or Pajara maybe can't do the job that they once did and one of these other players can do a similar kind of job or, or a different kind of job uh, that will help your team, then you bring them in. But you don't just drop a really good player uh, uh, to, to groom another player needlessly and i don't think that's how test cricket is played but thank you very much for your question mate uh who have we got next uh oh vamsi vamsi 
Ramsey has, I was going to say vam- vamished, but that's not a word. I meant vanished. Uh, um, can I ask you there? question then, uh, Jared, please? Uh, no, because there's a few other people coming through. How are you still on the thing? I don't know. Really <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no worries. I'll bring up, I'll bring up someone else. Uh, who have we got? I dare you. Hey, Jared, how are we doing? Yeah, very good. Uh, what have you got for me today? Yeah, so um, how long do you see Kohli like, playing the T20 format, given that India now has the bench strength to uh, take out players and like like put out two teams? So how long do you see Kohli playing yeah. in the T20 format? Are you dropping Virat Kohli? I mean... Like, uh, I'm not dropping him, but, like, how long do you see, like, if he has to continue playing tests and ODIs to a level? Hey, like, he's, he's not getting any younger. I wouldn't want to be the selector who makes that call. Um, realistically, I, I wouldn't be playing T20 internationals now. I'm not sure he necessarily needs to do that. Uh, I, he's playing enough IPL. You can always play him in uh, matches for India coming into tournaments if you need him to uh, pick up the skills. and. He's a talented enough player. There might be a ground... I, I could see someone like Coley just being like, I can play T20 and I can be a Test and ODI star. Do I really need to play T20 internationals? I could see that as a way of him resting himself. But I also see him as a natural winner and someone who wants to play and, you know, you know he wants to win every single moment and be, an, be a legend, essentially. So it's a really, really interesting one. From a tactical point of view, there are certainly other players that could replace him. Uh, you know, he is a very, very good T20 player, but he has I don't think he's even scratched the surface on how good a T20 player he could be. And if he's never going to get to that level, you, he m- might see himself as uh, not replaceable as such, but they might just be like, well, let's try someone else. But I just can't see in the current environment of Indian cricket, you dropping him. So it would have to be him making that decision, I would have thought, and and him stepping back. Do you see him as an opener or or as a number three? Like, if he's at number three, do you open with Rohit and Shekhar or Rohit and KL and then slot in Virat at three? Or do you uh, open with Rohit and Virat? I think he's... Pr- I want to say he's a natural number four, but his strike rate against spin is... N- not as not as good as I would like it to be, despite the fact I think he's a very good player of spin. Um, but he hasn't dominated T20 spin the way that he should. But that is, if you're asking me what position I think he should play, looking at the Indian lineup, you would you would I would almost want him as if it looks like the pitch is nipping around a little bit. I want him at number three in case there's an early wicket. Uh, if you lose your second wicket around the eighth over and you're feeling like your your lineup's a little bit more shallow and India doesn't always have the deepest batting lineup, you bring him in then. Um, and if not, he sort of rotates around the order as, as and when you need him. I mean, he has the ability to bat at six and seven because he's such a great player of pace bowling. So, and he, you know, he's a natural boundary hitter. Whether he needs the 20 balls to warm himself up or not is the interesting thing for him. Um, but he, I think he's so talented. He has all those roles, but I don't think he really thinks about T20 cricket in that way at the moment. Um, and that is, I think, what is holding him back. I don't think it's talent. I think he still has, uh, and there's a lot of players out there like that, that traditional mindset of hit a couple of boundaries, but then pull myself back. Very boundary single orientated. Um, and I think that fundamentally he could do a lot more than that. So I think you could fit him in a bunch of different roles. I don't think you need him to open just because I think they can find other openers who could do roughly the same thing as him. I'm not sure you can find as many p- players who have the ability to bat three and six the way that he could potentially do, which which actually shows you his overall value to a T20 team. It's just that he doesn't think that way. It, uh, we were talking, I was talking about Steve Smith before. They're so rooted in the fact that they need to be certain kinds of players uh, I think Steve Smith could still be a fantastic T20 player. It's just that he plays the innings in a very one-day one day style still. And it, it doesn't it, – it's not the best use of your resource, especially when you're one of the best five batters in the world. So you don't see him as an opener? Like if India – It's not that I don't see him as an opener. It's just that I think they can find other people who can do that job as good as him, whereas his ability really is – he can be a backup opener, which is what I would call a number three now. Um, and you can then slide him down the order. You know, the, he could come in at the 15th over mark when, when everyone's bowling pace at the end of the game. 
Um, and I think he'd be, I think he'd still be a really good player. Uh, the only thing is he needs some practice at those sorts of roles, but he has that talent. It's all within him, isn't it? So I, I don't have, I think he could be a much better T20 player than he is. I just, like many of those very talented players, I just think he thinks about it in a completely different way. Um, but I don't think, you, fundamentally, you, I don't think you can replace him with a player with more talent than him. What you might be able to f- replace him with is a, with a player who 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 thinks about T20 cricket a little bit more. Uh, I just got to move on, mate. I've just got a couple more questions come through, but thank you very much for that. Uh, and who we got? Oh, Sam, are you there? Yeah, hey, Jared. Also, hey, what was your question, mate? We recently saw a couple of series in the West Indies, the T20 series, West Indies, South Africa, and West Indies, Australia. Yep. How much do you think we can actually read into the strength of these teams going into the World Cup? Uh, so is Australia underperforming because they're missing key players or is South Africa winning because they want the matchup? So how much can we read into this? Look, it's a fantastic question. Uh, the answer is not that much because the, the West Indies South Africa series was really interesting for me because South Africa were desperate to win it because of everything that's going on in South African cricket. I don't know if you saw Rabada's interview at the end. I've never seen anyone that emotionally invested from, from a major nation in winning a kind of meaningless warm up series, uh, which is what it is. Uh, and then, and, and, and West Indies on the other hand, they were trying to work out things. They were trying plays in different roles. It, it, you know, that is, it's kind of like the All-Stars coming together. It's a bit like the USA basketball team when it comes to West Indies cricket. It's like, they've got all these great players now, but how do they fit? Because everyone opens the batting or is a middle orders or middle, uh, you know, end of overs um, enforcer. And how do you fit the bowling in? And they don't have the kind of all-round options of other teams. So I think in a, in a lot of these cases, what you're seeing is just teams trying to work out what is going to work for them. Even... Even with the Australian team, I think uh, you've seen that to a certain point. So I'm not looking at the wins and losses as much. I'm looking at the individual players and whether they've got a role that will work for them uh, going forward. And whether, you know, I, I always look, one of the things I always look at more than anything else is do they have 23 openers in their, in their squad? And are they trying to do that? And my guess is that that is what, so what Australia's got, the West Indies that they've just had, then they're going to Bangladesh. South Africa did West Indies, then they then they're doing Ireland. There's a few teams that are really bouncing around playing some good T20 cricket. I don't think it matters if you lose the majority of those games going into the World Cup. I think it matters that you know one to eleven or one to thirteen, if you will, what the best sort of lineup that you have and how it's going to work. And if you can pick, let's say, David Willey or Jason Berendorf type player. Uh, or, or um, you know someone like that and just bring them in and know that they're going to be able to bowl those overs and that the rest of the team will be able to rotate around their strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's what teams are trying to work out at the moment, uh, which is exactly what it should be. Um, too many T20 um, games are played internationally and they're just played. Um, and it really, you know, at the franchise level, there's a it's a much higher bar. So, um, it, it, you know, it's really, really interesting. But uh, thank, you, uh, thank you so much for your... Uh, Oh, I've lost you there. Thank you so much for your question, Sam. All right, here we go. Here we have Tess. I think Tess, are you there? Hey, hello, Tess. Hello. Um, I know you have like theories about the long-term sustainability of left-arm wrists been at the highest level. Um, <laughs> I, I have theories about that? everything, but yes, certainly that. Uh, okay, this is really, really interesting. This is about biomechanics. So we're, we're about to get very messy and nerdy here, Tess. So to bowl left arm wrist spin, you have to actually change your body a little bit compared to right arm wrist spin because most right arm wrist spinners, they train their body up until the age of, what, 18. They play majority 60, 70, 80% of the time against right-handers, right? Which means you can have a very high front arm, means you get good rotation through the ball, and those two things allow you, the high front arm allows you consistency of length and line, and the rotation through the ball allows you to spin the ball, right? So I I hope that makes sense to everyone. I'm doing this on the video. On the YouTube, everyone's like, got you, Jared. Uh, Everyone listening is like, wait, I've got to visualize this. When you are a left arm wrist spinner, you are training yourself against right-handers, which is obviously reversed for you, right? It's a different kind of thing, which means you need the ball to float further away 
Uh, and you also need your body to open up more because you need the wrong end because the wrong end becomes a lot more important to a left arm wrist spinner than to a right arm wrist spinner because it is the ball that goes away from right handers. I hope everyone's with me at the moment. And that, that the angle that you need to bowl it at means every single ball you're bowling drifts across, which means that naturally your right arm, which is your front arm in this case, has to fall away a little bit more, right? That means that it is very hard to consistently hit a line and length because of the body position that you've got in. It is harder to be a consistent left arm wrist spinner because of the shapes of your body, essentially, at that point. Now, the way that left arm wrist spinners overcome this is the fact that there's none of them, right? There's so few of them that for the first like three or four years that they bowl test, no one, no one has, no one's faced one. They, you, you very rarely face a good one. You very, very, it's very rare. Like I think of Brad Hogg in, and, and in fact, Shamsi, I reckon it's taken years for Shamsi to land the ball consistently, right? Brad Hogg landed the ball consistently, but probably more towards the end of his career, certainly didn't do it at the start of his career. And that is because they're overcoming this sort of natural flaw within their game. Um, but the ability that they have is if you're a young leg spinner and you can't land the ball on a good spot consistently, you generally, that's the end. Whereas if you're a long, young left arm wrist spinner, you have like a holiday period and some bowlers manage to overcome that. But if you look through the history of the game, I think I'm pretty, I think I'm on pretty safe ground here to say that it's not something that happens that naturally. A lot of times they, they have a good two, three, four year period and then they fall apart. So I think it's a biomechanics thing is, is probably the best way of putting it. And I think it's about that front arm. Uh, it's a real shame that I came up with this theory after Terry Jenner had passed away because I would have loved to have like found Terry Jenner and just and drilled him on it because I've never heard anyone do it, uh, anyone talk about it a lot. But it's something that I'll, I want to talk to Brad Hogg about on a, on a podcast one day. Um, so I'll try and get Hoggy to come on and explain it. But you almost, I think it needs to be someone who's worked a lot with coaching young left arm um, wrist spinners as well. I think you, you, you need that. Um, but I think there is a, there is, I don't want to say a physical flaw, but there's a biomechanical quirk to left arm wrist spinners that means that they cannot, in general, land the ball exactly where they want to land it as often as a right arm wrist spinner. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I'm sort of a, a follow up if there's time. Um, how come like yeah. three of the prominent left arm wrist spinners in the world at the moment are Afghan and that's like half of them? So what, who is it? Zahir Khan? Uh, am I missing Nora some? Nora Martin, Waka Salam Kale. Of course, yeah. Well, Waka Salam Kale is a really, really interesting one. So uh, I was working with his agent at one stage trying to get him more jobs, and there was a real feeling that he didn't quite have that control yet, and they were they were worried that people had started to play Zahir Khan and, and some others. But I can tell you for a fact that Waka Salam Kale, and also I've forgotten his name, um, uh, the Dutch slash New Zealand bowler who's now got good ripping. Is it Michael Rippert? Yeah. I remember trying to sell him to teams, right? You know, as a, as an analyst um, and as a, as a fan of his bowling. And everyone said the same thing about both those bowlers was they didn't trust them to land the ball consistently in the right area enough. They thought that they would get a couple of honeymoon games from them each and 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 they didn't they didn't in the teams that I was working with at the time or, or the people that I was talking to at the time they needed more than that they needed someone who could do it for ten games so there is so that feeling what within the to game Kulshik. yeah it, it's it's really really yeah you can see it a lot and one of the one of the more interesting ones is Paul Adams because if you remember he basically started as a left arm wrist spinner right and if you look at the end of his career he bowled left arm around the wicket. And basically, behold, wrist spin, but in a finger spin, left arm finger spin style, you know, with that big angle in and spinning it away. And I think um, that that had something to do with him just trying to get a repeatable um, a way of coming through. And so that could be really interesting if we get maybe a bunch of left arm wrist spinners who come around the wicket and spin the ball away naturally, and they're and they're sh straight one or they're the one that spins the other way is the traditional leg spinner. Um, so. That I think it would be stronger for their actions, but it does take away the natural. It, it, it takes away the court, the, the drifting away, spinning back um, part of it, which is a, a reason that you know Brad Hogg and, and some other left arm wrist spinners did what, so well. But Tess, that was an absolutely great question. Thank you very much for that. But just got to get on. I think I have time for one more. So let's see if Avi is there. Avi. Hi, Jared. 
Yeah, la- last question. Let's let's bring this home. I want you to I want you to think of yourself as a death bowler, honing in on those stumps. Unless I'm scooping, and then you should probably try the back of the hand slowable. I actually had a very very basic question. Um, just and I, I think I know the answer already, but I'd like to see more of your uh, insight on this. So, um, if you take uh, the example of uh, Virat and Steve Smith. Uh, pretty normal T20 international players. Like, they, normal as in they, they would almost play all games given normal conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so does Williamson. Joe Root, in fact, does not do that. He's not played a T20 game since like two years. So, um, obviously, we know that England has a much better white ball depth than at least Australia and New Zealand. Um, arguably uh, against India as well. But do you think that's the only reason why Joe Root does not play? Or is he genuinely not someone who who should make a, a T20 eleven? I think if you look recently, I think Joe Root has started to play for Yorkshire again. I think he might have played in last year. Uh, I'm trying to think back. I've got a feeling. I only I only monitor the games where he opens the bowling, and I've got a feeling he opened the bowling uh, last year. But you're right. But it's not just him. If you look at Ben Stokes, I think after the I think the game he played against India this year in one day as was the first one day internationally played since the World Cup final. So England, that is what England do to prolong their players because they do play too much cricket. I mean, they there's just no argument, I think, with English cricket. You can make smaller arguments with Australia and India at times, but England just play too much cricket. I think what happened with with Joe Root was probably almost an error, um, looking back on it, because you look at some of the innings he played in the 2016 World Cup. I think he's played some of the best T20 innings in that era. In that era, plus he can bowl, um, and it's a fantastic runner between wickets. Which, okay, it's not the most important thing in T20 cricket, but especially in those middle overs, it can be quite handy. So, uh, look, I think what happened was he kind of slipped through the cracks a little bit because they did, they thought they maybe didn't need him, uh, and they could move on a little bit. But they were always a bit iffy with with Joe Root. I've written about Ben Stokes not being a specialist T20 player. Uh, there's certainly problems with the game of Kane Williamson at times, of Steve Smith, of Virat Kohli, uh, of Baba Azam. I could list them. There's heaps of them, right? Play oh, Mitchell Stark, we were talking about before, uh, you know. If all of those guys played T20 cricket far more and focused on it far more, I think they would all be absolutely top-level T20 players because I think they all have the skills needed uh, to be able to be successful at that sport. But they don't, and they don't think about it in the same way that specialists do. And they don't think about it in the same way that someone like A.B. De Villiers has and, and, and some other players who aren't even, well, A.B. is a specialist now, but even beforehand weren't. And I think it really does come down to that. But fundamentally, if, you know, if you were dream, if you could, if you could change their mindsets a little bit and get them to play more T20 cricket, I think almost all of those players would be fantastic. Uh, you know, when it comes down to it, they can hit boundaries off the best bowlers in the world. And, you know, in a World Cup final, you, you know, you want Joe Root probably to be in that position where Joe Root specifically fits. If Johnny Bairstow is going to bat at four and um, Ben Stokes or Dawid Milan is going to bat at three, then you have an issue of where Joe Root fits. But if Joe Root had been playing consistently, um, you know, I'm not sure that would even be a conversation. He's such a good player. Um, you... I don't think there's a better player in the world at the ability. I'm not even sure. I'm, I might even go all time in this. I'm not sure I've ever seen a better batter, better batter at rotating the strike. So I'm going I'm to leave you guys there. There you go. There's, there's the hottest take there. Joe Root is the best strike rotator I've ever seen. Yeah, that's the kind of, the, the kind of hot takes you get on, on, on Red Inca podcast and the wagon wheel. Um, this will go up if you've been if you just joined us late on a Spotify Green Room. This will go up on Red Inca um, within the next couple of days. It'll be up on YouTube as well. Uh, if you want to follow us on a Spotify Green Room, you download the app, you search for my name, and then you should get a notification. Generally, we do them around twelve to one on uh, Fridays uh, uh, UK time, uh, but it just probably depends on my schedule. But we're, I'm going to try and do one a week. Great questions today. I really thought there was just some fantastic questions. Uh, so thank you very much for all your questions and uh, thank you very much for listening and I'll talk to you all very soon. Goodbye.